Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the Korean Peninsula. This episode was produced in cooperation and with the support of the East Asian Study Center at The Ohio State University. News and discussions about technology in North Korea usually focus on the country's nuclear program. Often ignored, however, is the fact that over the course of the past decade, consumer technology has also evolved. Maybe most importantly, cell phones have become increasingly widespread. They are now a common sight in the streets of Pyongyang and border cities. This is a momentous change which coincides with the emergence of a new generation, millennials, in North Korea. To learn more about the role that technology, and especially cell phones, plays in North Korean society, we had the pleasure of interviewing Professor So Kyung Kim. She told us about North Korean millennials and their characteristics, where North Korea stands in terms of technology, how technology and foreign media consumption interact to produce emergent trust networks among North Koreans, and why North Korea's regime permits the spread of such a technology in the first place. Suk Young Kim is a professor and head of theater and performance studies at UCLA. She received her PhD in interdisciplinary theater and drama with a certificate in gender studies from Northwestern University and her PhD in Slavic languages and literature from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her first book, Illusive Utopia, Theater, Film and Everyday Performance in North Korea, was the winner of the 2013 James Pelley Book Prize from the Association for Asian Studies. More recently, she published K-Pop Live, Fans, Idols and Multimedia Performance. Professor Suk Young Kim, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for having me. Today we'll be discussing the role technology plays in North Korean society and the ways in which it has made foreign media accessible in North Korea. What got you interested in this topic? It actually started with uh, this anecdotal rumors or bits of media coverage that I keep encountering in the past five to ten years that um, North Korea is now finding ways to somehow communicate with the world, join the broader kind of forces of Korean wave in very creative ways. And that kind of parked my interest. Um, and in the past, I spent quite a bit of time writing a book on state-produced media, especially theater, film, and everyday performance. And that book titled Elusive Utopia pretty much covered the history of North Korea leading up to the new millennium. But I realized that the book really did not address the radical changes that has really defined millennial North Korea. So I had this desire to write a sequel to that book. In your research, you focus on millennials. As basic as this question may be, are there millennials in North Korea? Yes, I think so. Uh, I think the more localized way of addressing millennials in North Korea would be marketplace generation, 장마당 세대. And I think the reason I focus on millennials in North Korea is because I really do see a kind of paradigm shift in their worldview, the way of living, and their value system. Um, as many listeners know, there were some just really seismic changes that uh, took place in North Korea in mid-1990s with uh, the development of uh, nuclear weapons and really devastating famine and the collapse of state-centered economic system that really kind of dismantled the ways of being in North Korea prior to millennial generations. So I think that this is a different generation that had to kind of fend for themselves and not further being reliant on the state support, uh, especially food rationing system. So, um, you know, we all have those kind of paradigm shifting moments. I mean, we're living through one right now. I think we'll always remember time as pre-COVID, after COVID. And I think 1990s in North Korea were those times where ways of being really radically shifted. And I was very curious to follow how they adjusted and survived and some thrived through these thorough crises that define their political and economic ways of being in a very different modalities. So how would you describe, let's say, the pre-1990s generation of Korea? And how does this post-1990s generation differ from its predecessors? I think the pre-millennial generation has 
really sincere sense of loyalty to the state. And their genuine love and support for the state leaders really fueled the society. Of course, there always has been some faction of dissident groups within North Korea, but it's, a, it's remarkable that a state like North Korea with very limited resources, and especially after the collapse of Soviet Union, it just went through um, so much of foundational crisis, and yet people's loyalty somehow remained in its place to sustain the society as a whole. But I think such centralized perspective on the state started to really dismantle with economic crisis in mid-1990s, uh, what they call Gonane Hengun, uh, arduous march. I think what's different in North Korean millennials is that they're very aware of market activities, which wasn't you know, by choice, but they had really no choice but to really be attentive to how to support themselves and their families by participating in these underground marketplaces, which more or less have become legitimized by the state since then. And I think there's more kind of attention paid to individuals' well-being, advancement, as opposed to its prior generation. Um, and I think millennials are much more aware of what's happening in the world as opposed to the prior generation. And this, of course, coincides with the uh, spread of cell phone networks. And although North Korean cell phones cannot directly you know, reach outside world, they find creative ways to receive information from outside world using cell phones, especially residents in the border area between China and North Korea are the first one to kind of receive outside information through many channels of exchange with China and beyond. So I think there are so many layers of differences that really define North Korea as a changing society rather than stagnant and anachronistic society that often outside world portrays North Korea to be. Has this new generation emerged homogeneously throughout North Korea or is it maybe geographically concentrated? You mentioned the border towns. Is that where you find most of those new millennials? Or is it also in the countryside or just in Pyongyang? Right, that's a great question. I don't think millennials in North Korea are homogenous by any means, just like elsewhere. We can't just say millennials in the States or in South Korea have this kind of you know uniform look. I mean, it's by no means such a simplistic demographic group that we're talking about in North Korea as well. So as you mentioned, I think uh, residents of border towns tend to be fast adapters of world's information as well as goods, because through this unofficial trade route that takes place between the border uh, region, is putting these border towns such as Hyesan, Hwaryong on a, on a kind of central map. And sometimes North Korean millennials even say that, why would you want to live in Pyongyang nowadays? You know, because <laughs> we get everything faster and more easily. And this is, a, I think, another kind of noticeable shift when you think about the geographic significance of Pyongyang that defined the previous generation. I mean, I think if you look at pre-millennial generation, I think there is still very much awe and respect and just, you know, sheer desire for the city of Pyongyang and its lifestyle. But I think that has shifted a lot because uh, border towns are now the first kind of trend setters and adapters of the outside world information and goods. I think also another thing to consider when we think about the diversity of North Korean millennial generation is the rise of women's influence in North Korean society. You know, those who participated in economic activities outside of state-defined structure were women. Um, and this has a lot to do with uh, the system that North Korea has instilled for generations, which is to say that the male breadwinner of any given family has to report to their workplace. Otherwise, they're penalized. So men were still very much tied to their government-assigned job places, whether that be a bureaucratic office or factory or farmland, men still had very much the obligation to report to their workplace, which prohibited them from freely participating in market economy. So it, it fell upon women, mothers, sisters to really go out into this black market 
and sell what they could and procure, you know, goods from the other side of the border and bring it back to North Korea and vice versa. So women's economic power kind of really increased since 1990s economic crisis. And this has generated a lot of cultural kind of discourse and shift to the point that we sometimes hear, you know, anecdotal jokes such as like, oh, men are just like barking dogs. They just bark, 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 make noises, but they don't actually do anything. And a lot of parody songs that kind of play around, you know, traditional communist children's songs and changing the lyrics to praise the mothers who go out to marketplaces and make living for their families. So this kind of rise in women's economic power has also brought about a kind of, you know, shift in gender dynamics as well. Can we see this idea of a millennial generation in North Korea also within North Korea? Or do these millennials consider themselves in one way or another different from prior generations? Yes, um, the self-perception, I think, is a really important aspect of it. From what I can tell, I mean, I, you know, my information mostly comes from the interviews that are done by North Korean resettlers now living outside of North Korea. This is the only way we can actually have some glimpse into North Korea. But I think there is a kind of conspicuous self-reflection on who they are as a generation. And I think one defining feature of that could be the rise of marketplace as a central hub of sustaining livelihood. And another kind of self-reflective moment is that now North Korea is a nuclear state. And I think this is a sort of a different aspect of millennial generations self-reflection as a significantly different generation than its predecessors. So now North Korea as a nuclear state can also kind of create this pride and uh, self-awareness as empowered nation, which kind of counterbalances everything that I have been sharing so far as this kind of sarcastic, um, sardonic, you know, awareness about how North Korea is like not what the state claims to be. But there is also another aspect of it is that there seems to be kind of degree of pride in uh, living in a nuclear state that can kind of talk back to the United States and kind of stand on its own grounds. So, yes, I think there is awareness of themselves as a kind of different uh, group of people in, in kind of both positive and also negative way. You mentioned interviews. Was that your main way of researching this project? Yes, as you correctly pointed out, because uh, information doesn't flow as freely as it should in and out of North Korea, which is a grave challenge for any researchers uh, looking into North Korea, I think you have to really look at both ways, meaning that you have to look at the uh, top-down perspective, meaning what the North Korean state says about itself. And uh, this aspect of research can be rather easily done because, you know, you have archives, newspapers, which serve as a mouthpiece for North Korean state leadership. But the other side of the perspective looking uh, bottom up is very difficult to research. And I think there isn't any better alternative than try to talk to North Koreans who lived through this crucial transitional period. And they happen to be outside of North Korea, especially in South Korea. There are about 33,000 resettlers representing various age group and generation, but vast majority of them happen to be millennials because, you know, escaping North Korea is a very arduous process and it requires certain physical strength to endure that process. So a lot of them happen to be, you know, in their 20s to 40s. Primarily, they happen to be millennials. But there's also limitation in speaking to this particular demographics because, you know, they represent certain kind of faction of North Korea. I mean, people who decide to leave the place of their birth and go to the uh, traditionally defined enemy state, which is South Korea, happen to represent a certain group of people. So you have to be kind of careful not to overgeneralize. So the trick, I think, is to find kind of complex middle ground that you can kind of sketch out by looking into top-down and bottom-up approach. From an outsider's perspective, it is difficult to tell where North Korea is in terms of technology. 
On the one hand, North Korea gives the impression of lagging behind most other countries. On the other hand, there are plenty of reports about TV shows made in South Korea being enjoyed in North Korea. Could you explain where North Korea actually stands in terms of modern communications and media consumption technologies? Compared to outside world, especially South Korea, which happens to be a very wired, uh, tech-savvy nation, uh, North Korea lags behind. So uh, the, the widely used cell phone technology is still 3G, whereas the world has adopted 5G as of today. So it's very much lagging behind. However, what interests me in this kind of picture of disparity is how North Koreans, especially kind of younger tax savvy generation, tend to bring up creative measures to overcome that lag. And I think this is where uh, the, the, the notion of kind of living creatively under and with surveillance comes in. And the way they access outside world information I mean, is like, propelled by this incredible thirst to really know what goes beyond North Korea. And I think there is like, it's, I think it's fair to say that there is fairly well conceived notion that, you know, they're not aware of the, the rest of the world. I think there is that awareness, self-awareness coming from North Koreans that their eyes and ears are somehow blocked by the state surveillance. So the creative measures that they kind of come up with to access outside information, I mean, it's like, it's, it's really incredible. There are all kinds of stories that I was able to collect in actually learning how they actually access outside world information. One example is uh, North Korea in 2000s really launched this campaign to bring its population to kind of world level in terms of computer use and computer technology. So there was this government campaign to uh, really instill tax savviness and uh, computer skill sets at school education level. So they imported a lot of used computers from Japan and China and very well educated college students in North Korea, such as Kim Tech Tech University students who are charged with cleaning up the computer and getting it ready for general use. And they have discovered a lot of deleted film files and computer games such as Super Mario as they were cleaning up this imported computer. And they actually started uh, using it uh, and spreading it and sometimes selling it to a more general public. So uh, this is one example of how they creatively kind of restored the deleted files from these used imported computers. And more broadly known story of accessing South Korean pop culture is, of course, through active underground trade that takes place between China and North Korea. In the past, maybe 10 years ago, people would import, you know, VCDs, what North Koreans call alpan. And, and they're, they tend to be bulky. So they tend to really bring, you know, one VCD and illegally copy in massive amount and sell them at marketplace with a different cover on it. So even if VCDs are loaded with South Korean dramas or news coverage or reality shows, the cover image would feature something like Boy General, Sonyeon Jangs, which is a popular North Korean animation. So, you know, at a first look, you wouldn't necessarily know that the VCD contains South Korean materials. And actually the first 20 minutes or so would contain the actual, you know, animation made by North Korea, which is also popular. So, this kind of surreptitious network of distribution importation really created alternative social groups in North Korea, and which I think is really the most important aspect of studying technological shift in North Korea, more than the technological advancement itself. What I see it as being more crucial in gauging North Korean millennial transformation is this alternative social network that's based on trust that really kind of counters the traditional kind of collective social network. So yeah, North Korea lags behind. However, it is doing what it can in a very creative way to catch up with the rest of the world. And nowadays, of course, the broadest means of circulating South Korean materials is the small SD cards, which tend to be much easier to hide when, when you're kind of facing crackdowns or surveillance.
you've mentioned computers, SD cards, VCDs. Where do cell phones fit into this story? Are they just a natural upgrade um, to what used to be, or did it change something fundamental in the, maybe the scale or scope of this newly created network? Cell phones, of course, cannot be directly connected to outside network. So it's very much a domestic service network. So people in North Korea can call each other from one end to the other, but they cannot talk to, say, somebody in China or South Korea in principle. However, cell phones are also central gadgets in propelling this creative dodging of surveillance, uh, especially for residents in border region. So if you are a resident in Hyesan or Hwaryeong, some of the main border towns in North Korea, you could actually kind of smuggle in uh, Chinese cell phones that's being serviced by Chinese cell phone networks. So uh, you could still catch signals. If you go up on the mountain in Hyesan, you could pretty much easily catch the Chinese signals. So that way, uh, if you're a resident in border towns, you could have a channel of communication with the outside world. And of course, from there, you can not only talk to folks in China, but also use that Chinese serviced uh, cell phone to call South Korea and so on and so forth. So this is how cell phones become a major kind of tool to circumvent this very tight control over how communication and information is conducted in North Korea. And also cell phones as portable gadgets, you know, you could plug in USB flash drive or SD cards into your cell phone, uh, which are loaded with forbidden foreign media materials. So oftentimes, you know, you can encounter stories such as how, you know, middle school children uh, with cell phone somehow during school break could watch South Korean drama with their close friends um, by plugging in USB drive or SD card. So these could be the hardware to play the software that's forbidden. Also, another way uh, cell phones participate in this kind of changing worldview and economic activities for millennials is because it enabled real-time communication within North Korea, the market activity has drastically changed according to that. So what I mean by that is prior to the introduction of cell phones, a merchant who brings, say, certain products from China could sell the product at, at the border town for, say, 100 won. But when it reaches inland, he or she could sell it for 200 won or 300 won because North Koreans lacked means to compare real-time prices for certain products, right? But nowadays, that's impossible to do so because a merchant sitting in Kaesong can call somebody in Hwaryeong and say, how much does a kilogram of rice cost there? And they can really exchange the market prices in real time. So this has kind of change the landscape of the distribution of imported goods throughout North Korea. And it has enabled much more uh, standardized, streamlined market price that people can reference. And it has created this like real time sense of real time information exchange, which I think in the long run contributes to their desire to participate in real time information exchange with the outside world. So. Um, uh, cell phones are crucial in that sense that many people use it to access outside world news, especially if you're a person living in border towns, and they pay particular attention to the news of U.S. sanction on North Korea or uh, U.N. sanction on North Korea, because once they have access to such news, they can pretty much predict what items will increase in prices say if there's like sanction on fuel, then they know that the fuel price will double, triple, so they can target the importation, the illegal kind of underground importation of those items into North Korea so that their profit will increase. So in a way, although this is all done under the table, they have somehow learned ways to participate in real-time economy, engaging outside partners. You mentioned the example of traders having access to cell phones, but also middle schoolers. Is it fair to say that it's common to have a cell phone then? Like most families probably have maybe one or more cell phones. Is that, is that fair to say? 
Um, that depends on which demographic group that we're looking at. So yes, in Pyongyang, it's very uh, common to see people with cell phones on the streets. And cell phones have really become, and this is, I'm quoting a uh, scholar Kim Yono's uh, research, it has become an object of conspicuous consumption. So cell phones, even if they don't really become involved in communication with the outside world, I mean, just possessing the latest model of Arirang smartphone itself can make lot of kind of statement, right, about one's social status, economic status. So Kim hyo uh, in his research mentioned that, you know, any Pyongyang um, young man, if he wants to get a serious day, <laughs> he should possess the latest cell phone. And I also heard other North Korean resettlers confirm that idea that these like North Korean young men just flash out their latest smartphones when girls pass by just to show off. So this is pretty much typical scene in Pyongyang, um, and children tend to have cell phones if their parents are wealthy, and um, if their parents are wealthy enough to buy rights to own more than one cell phone, because you know the, the law would have it that one family can only want, own one cell phone, but they also find ways to circumvent that prohibition by, uh, say, paying somebody who can never own cell phone to borrow their name for registration. So in effect, like one person can have multiple cell phones and they would give some to their children so that they can, you know, have the status in that school and whatnot. So this is Pyongyang. However, if you go to uh, more remote areas, of course, you can't find cell phones as commonly as you would in Pyongyang. And, and the models that they use might be lagging behind. You know, if you look at the latest uh, North Korean cell phone models, I mean, they're pretty much like Samsung Galaxy phones or latest iPhones. In terms of technology, there isn't much difference. However, if you go to provincial towns, which are, you know, neither Pyongyang nor border uh, cities, then uh, you would still find, you know, ZTE models and some old models that you don't really, you know, find elsewhere outside in the world. Cell phones seem like a very disruptive technology then, especially for a government as focused on stability as North Korea is. Why did it allow phones to become more readily available then? That's a great question. And um, I also kind of uh, reflected on that question um, because, yes, I mean, cell phones enable kind of minor scale, big scale revolutions, right? So why would North Korea so concerned about controlling information flow so tightly allow for this. And I think as much as cell phones enable free flow of information, it also enables easy surveillance on conversations that are taking place. I mean, I'm speaking now from North Korean state perspective, that eavesdropping on cell phones has facilitated surveillance mechanism on part of North Korean state. So every North Korean interviewee that I spoke to know and understand that their phone calls are being tapped and they have to be very careful in their conversations because they, they all know that um, somebody is listening in. So this, in a way, kind of explains partially why North Korea allowed for this. But I think more important reason than that is that the the economic crisis that really uh, shook the foundation of uh, North Korean state had to be uh, you know, solved by creating cash flow for the state leadership and charging uh, exorbitant amount for cell phone registration somehow solved this problem. So in North Korea, if you are a legitimate cell phone holder, you have to, of course, register it. And the registration fee is not by any means cheap. So the latest model of cell phone registration fee would be $1,000. And it goes to the state. And used models and older models would be little less than that, uh, ranging from 300 to 600 But still, that cash goes into the pocket of the state. And what's funny is that when North Korea charges cell phone registration fee, they don't accept North Korean currency nor Chinese yuan, but they only accept U.S. dollars. 
So this creates tremendous cash flow for the state, which really helped the financial difficulties of the leadership. So we can all do the math. If um, there are about 600 self-registered cell phones in North Korea, and we do the math, I mean, it creates tremendous revenue for the state. What have been the ways in which North Korea has tried to regulate and control its telecommunications? You mentioned tapping. Are there other ways? And in your opinion, are those successful at all? I think for the large part, surveillance has worked, right, and is working. And um, this is where I hark back to my previous kind of precautionary note about being careful about ethnographic research, because you're only dealing with kind of very limited sample of people. And I think the vast majority of North Koreans living in North Korea probably are very compliant with the the strict regulations. And the most people that I've talked to are rule breakers, right? That's why they're outside of North Korea today. So in my view, the surveillance has worked and is still working. And some of the measures that they use to make sure that, you know, the words don't mix, (laughs) so to say, is to create different service networks. So, for example, if you look at the computer networks, uh, North Korea only has intranet. So even if you have access to network in North Korea using, you know, personal computer, you can only access information within North Korea, and that's strictly controlled by the government. And there is a different network for foreign correspondents, diplomats, whose network can access outside world. So if you're, say, foreign correspondent using computer network in Pyongyang, you could search Google, you could, you know, send email to your colleagues, you know, maybe sitting somewhere else in the world. So these networks are extremely siloed and they're not supposed to mix And there's a separate network for high official governments who, of course, have access to outside information. Of course, these are very limited people. So North Korea has created this very siloed network system for its domestic users, foreigners within North Korea, and its high-ranking officials. And uh, cell phone networks have the same model of being very siloed so that it is ensured that uh, domestic users of cell phones can only talk to other domestic users and whatnot. So I think for the most part, it has worked. Have encrypted apps, so let's say, for example, um, Telegram, been used in the North Korean context at all? I'm not sure about Telegrams per se, but when North Koreans have cell phone conversation while being fully aware of being tapped, they use a lot of encrypted language, vocabulary, or expression that those who are not aware of the coding would never understand what they mean. I've encountered a couple of uh, North Korean defectors who share their stories of coordinating how to escape North Korea. Because, I mean, they usually have to do it with the help of uh, so-called brokers. And these are professional people who specialize in bringing um, North Koreans out of the country, uh, helping them cross the river and hand them over to another broker in China who would then be a guide, uh, helping them come down to the third state of Laos or Thailand so that they can reach uh, South Korean embassies' help. So... um, When would-be North Korean defectors coordinate their meeting time and escape plans with brokers, they use coded language, such as, I'm just making this up, but it's pretty similar to this, like, oh, uh, the the moon is bright in midnight on the mountain or something like that. It means that uh, at midnight, they would meet at a certain spot at the mountain so that they can uh, cross the river to the Chinese side. So there's a lot of encrypted language there. Also, um, because cell phones, among other uh, hardware, have been just very actively used for watching South Korean dramas, it has generated a lot of neologism among millennials. Um, And sometimes they adopt, you know, South Korean lingo that has become very popular uh, with the help of dramas or films. And they somehow become encrypted language among among North Korean millennials. One prime example of that is ramyeon mokko galle. 
uh, would you like to have cold noodle with me? I mean, that became very popular in South Korea after um, it became uh, featured in, in the film uh, Spring Day, Bomnal, featuring Lee Young-hye. And that means like, you know, put it plainly, would you like to hook up with me is the meaning of it. And that somehow became very widely adopted by North Korean millennials who are in the know those who have access to South Korean media and understand what that means. And they use it to kind of show that they are aware of this kind of media content and they use it, you know, in its original context. So um, those kind of neologism and encrypted expressions really help to somehow create this alternative social network that I've mentioned before. Clearly, South Korean media are frequently discussed in the context of North Korea. Are there any other major items that are, that are used as source of inspiration? Do they watch also, let's say, Chinese or Japanese entertainment products? Or do they also listen to South Korean music? I think what unites North Korea and South Korea, without any doubt, is its anti-Japanese sentiment. <laughs> so Japanese media has no kind of foothold in North Korea, as far as I can tell. I might be missing out on certain things. But I think Chinese media are more um, broadly accepted by North Korea, partly because the state doesn't uh, control it as much as it does uh, with South Korean media. Um, so you would you would really hear a lot of stories about how um, you know popular Chinese media products such as The Emperor's Daughter, which is like this historical drama, was widely watched by North Koreans. Partly because, you know, they weren't subject to heavy surveillance by North Korean state and yet still presented a a different way of making dramas, different narrative styles, different acting styles to North Koreans. So, yeah, I I would say that Chinese, Russian um, kind of media products were also broadly circulated with forbidden South Korean media products. And uh, coming back to South Korea, of course, Dramas were the ones that really paved way for North Korean people's desire to watch anything South Korean. But nowadays, the popularity of dramas have somehow gave way to other types of media products, such as um, K-pop music videos, um, news coverage, and particularly reality variety shows nowadays. So, And this somehow, in a way, kind of coincides with the popularity shift within South Korea, right? I mean, in the uh, early 2000s, I mean, you had this mega hit South Korean dramas such as Winter Sonata, Jewel in the Palace. And of course, South Korean dramas are still very much popular. But uh, since then, you know, other media products such as K-pop with its music videos and variety shows have also risen in its popularity overseas. And I think North Korean consumption pattern reflects that. So more recent defectors say that they've watched the latest episodes of Appa Odiga, (laughs) Dad, Where Are You Going? And this popular kind of reality shows are now being uh, widely consumed by North Koreans. What about U.S. or non-Asian foreign medias? So um, foreign media, I think, can largely be... uh, concentrated in Eastern European media products. I mean, and this has been a long living tradition in North Korea. So even before mid 1990s, North Koreans had fairly good access to those Eastern European or Russian uh, media products, particularly through their participation in film festivals and uh, hosting film festivals such as, uh, you know, Pyongyang International Film Festival. So there has been a reasonable exchange of films and other TV uh, products between kind of that Eastern Bloc and Pyongyang. When I was researching um, North Korean film journals for my previous book, Elusive Utopia, I was very impressed by how in 1950s North Korea, they had column where they specifically reviewed Eastern European films from Romania, Czechoslovakia then. It just really was impressive to see how international their filmic outlook was. And of course, all of that sort of changed in early 60s as they were 
trying to instill the cult of Kim Il Sung and just kind of silenced all the outside voices. But I mean, even in back in the 50s, there was fairly good coverage of Eastern European films. And, you know, even during this uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, many Soviet films were shown in Pyongyang and Pyongyang uh, filmmakers were able to show their films in film festivals in Carlo Vari, for example, which famously also hosted films made by Shin Sang-ho, the, the film director abducted by Kim Jong-il to make North Korean films. And what about U.S. media? That's, that's sort of a murky area that I haven't really fully researched. I mean, we hear a lot about Kim Jong-il's cinemania, and you know, we hear anecdotes about how Rambo uh, is one of his favorite films, but I am not quite sure how popular it is among ordinary viewers. Yeah, that's the one, one area where I haven't really focused. Generally speaking, what kind of punishment is expected um, if you get caught with foreign media? Is it, is it a fine or does it get more serious? That depends on who you are and what kind of resource you have. If you have means to bribe yourself out of this jail time or any kind of punishment, then you will be okay. There might be some consequences, such as being demoted or being expelled from your school. But if you have means to bribe the authorities, you will spare your life. However, if you happen to be a very unlucky individual without means to bribe yourself out of punishment, and if you happen to be caught during this special crackdown campaign where uh, North Korean authorities are very keen on setting an example for other people to see, then you could even get executed. And I've heard several stories, confirmed stories of having witnessed such executions, and the only crime was to distribute or consume sensitive forbidden materials. And I think it also depends on what you distribute and what you consume. So, for example, if you are the distributor of pornographic materials, uh, the consequence of being caught is very severe, most likely capital punishment or very severe service time in concentration camps. So it also depends on those kind of content material themselves, depending on how sensitive North Korean authorities react to, the response will vary. The price to pay can be steep in some situations, yet people clearly do still consume this media. Why is that? Is it mainly about entertainment and escapism, or is there more to it than just that? It's a great question. I mean, I think the easy answer, easy but true answer would be escapism and fascination with something similar yet different. So I think what, what I hear quite frequently from North Korean resettlers is that when they see these Uh, ways of South Korean life being played out in these dramas, they can understand the language, but the language itself is like Seoul dialect. So there's that titillating fascination with something similar yet different. And of course, the, the people's values presented in, represented in South Korean drama tend to be very individualistic, which they can relate to, yet so different from North Korean official way of life, of emphasizing the collective good and advancement. So this kind of sameness, yet different qualities are fascinating. And of course, uh, life in North Korea, generally speaking, is hard. You know, it's marked by hardship for vast majority of people. And I think it does provide this fantasy escapism. But I think there is something more significant than that. And uh, this is particularly kind of, you know, filtered through my sensibilities about how cell phones have become such major kind of game changer in North Korean society. If you look at the most popular South Korean TV dramas that were widely viewed by North Korean millennials, you find that all of them, in a way, feature cell phone technology that has yet to be introduced to North Korea. So, for example... You know, one of the most popular South Korean dramas ever seen by North Koreans is uh, Kaul Dongwa, Autumn's Tale. It was released in South Korea in 2001 and started to be shown in North Korea maybe three, four years later than that. And 
back then, there wasn't widely used kind of cell phone network in North Korea. Well, popularization of North Korean cell phones took place after 2009. So the drama featured cell phone communication at crucial moments of kind of defining human relationship. And North Koreans were already seeing that prior to actually having such communication networks. And I think you can say that about a lot of other dramas as well, such as Cheonggukui um, Gedan, Stairway to Heaven, Boys Over Flowers, Kopoda Namja, Hyoreseon Kude, My Love from Another Star, all of which have enjoyed significant popularity within North Korea, all feature very uh, interesting way of using cell phones prior to them being introduced to North Korean reality. So in a way, what's significant for me is that these dramas almost became textbooks for featuring how cell phones can be used and how they play a significant role in punctuating human relationship and sociality. In your opinion, does consuming foreign media translate into um, opinions on politics and society that are potentially problematic in North Korea? Yes, I would say uh, that's what I have gathered so far. What the typical story I hear is that when these um, consumers, are, uh, North Korean viewers, are kind of invited to watch or uh, South Korean uh, materials or listen to South Korean songs, they tend to be very firmly resistant in the beginning. They say that that's forbidden. I cannot do that. That's betrayal. That's dangerous. But once they have crossed the line and have accessed those South Korean media contents, then for vast majority of cases, they translate into skepticism about their own political regime, their own daily kind of hardship and the lack of freedom the lack of freedom to kind of groom their own bodies the way they want to be, because there's a lot of fashion police within North Korea that if you wear big you know, accessories or put a lot of makeups beyond reasonable level, then they could really uh, ask you to change, alter your bodily presentation. So a lot of discontent about that all kind of seem to stem from their knowledge of what South Koreans do and look like and live their lives. So I would, my answer would be yes. How do the values depicted in South Korean dramas interact with North Korean values? Are they contents on display that North Koreans simply don't like? I think that's a really great question. I think for the, the major attraction that uh, North Korean viewers find in South Korean drama are this intense emotional display of an individual, which is very foreign to them, but nevertheless is an attractive idea because we're all human beings. We all experience intense, you know, joy and heartbreak stemming from love interest. And I think South Korean dramas effusively display that. I mean, that's like the pinnacle of South Korean drama, right? So um, that I think is, again, another point of difference as well as similarity. But I think there is also a point about money, money politics, I think speak also very strangely and strongly to North Koreans. You know, a lot of South Korean Jebol dramas tend to be very popular in North Korea. And I think I already mentioned those, such as Kaul Dongha, Kokboda Namja, all of those feature Jebol as main protagonist, right? And they tend to be very popular. And you have to think about why they speak so strongly to North Koreans. And of course, it introduces a very harsh capitalist mindset that North Koreans have not been used to. And I think that's that's kind of shocking, very uh, much marking the, the departure from very different value system. But at the same time, that tends to be the reality that North Koreans are faced with with the millennial kind of shift, because now everyone has to work for their own survival, advancement, and well-being in North Korea. And this kind of very plutocratic and money-oriented values that tend to sort of be heavily criticized in North Korea are now their reality to be embraced. So again, it's very tricky that I think there's a lot of differences that also turn to be the new reality in North Korea, 
and therefore fascinating for North Korean viewers to watch. One of the biggest drama in South Korea in the past couple of years was Crash Landing on You, which is both a sort of chebol drama, as you describe it, but also involves North Korea directly. Have you heard any feedback or any, any sense of how it was received in North Korea? Right. So that drama was aired when COVID started. And since COVID, I think a lot of this uh, underground communication between North Korea and outside world has come to a halt because North Korea shut down its borders early on and they were very strict about keeping their border impenetrable. So um, with that drama, it was very hard for me to understand how people uh, received it, if they received it at all. So that's hard to comment on. However, North Korean authorities had vehement response to that drama through their uh, kind of mouthpiece, you know, newspaper that's operating in Japan, Joseon Shinbo. So they criticized uh, South Korean creators for kind of demeaning North Korean soldiers because there is one scene in that drama where North Korean soldiers infiltrate Seoul to carry out their mission. And as they're walking through the streets of Seoul, they're all in awe. Oh, wow, like how prosperous Seoul is. And they were very upset about the depiction of, false depiction of its national subjects. So we do hear the official response coming from the state, which was very negative. But I have no way of accessing whether the drama reached North Korea or if it did, how it was received. A central argument to your research is this creation of this new trust network that emerges from sharing this illicit content. How did this network develop over time and where do you see them going in terms of their impact on North Korean society? Yes, I think the secretive network built on familial ties and trust I think is propelled by the spread of media. Because I mean, as I mentioned, the consequence of being discovered when you're watching this forbidden media can be serious, sometimes fatal. So you really have to only approach those that you can trust. And that nature of that trust, I think, is very different than this kind of imposed collective sociality that has defined North Korea in, in previous generations, such as you know, five household units will be bundled into one and they would all care for each other, watch over each other and tell on each other if something goes wrong. It's very different kind of human network that we're talking about when we're mentioning this kind of alternative social network. So usually that kind of secret trust and spread of foreign media takes place within family members, very close friends that you trust, or colleagues that you can rely on, neighbors that you can rely on. Otherwise, it doesn't travel beyond that. And I think those kind of alternative ties are much thicker and stronger than the official collective ties that's imposed top down. And I think those secret, uh, undetected ties do create a degree of serious skepticism and challenge for the state. But Where is it going is a, is a question that nobody perhaps can answer because I, mean, I'm, I won't be foolish enough to predict what's going to happen in the future. But at the same time, if I have to put a prognosis of what it is, I don't think that those secretive networks are strong enough to create some substantial subversion or dismantling of the state system. And I think I can explain this in terms of how ownership of private property in North Korea nowadays are allowed with all these marketplace being the center, kind of central focus of one's economic activity. But at the same time, North Korea does not have any measures to protect those private properties accrued by individuals. So private properties are allowed, but there's no legal measures to protect them, right? And I think by analogy, we can kind of see that, yes, individuals' access to foreign media are taking place. They're not allowed, but they're taking place anyway, despite the state desire to control. But does it have this subversive power to topple the regime? I don't think so. Not yet. 
But future is an unknown territory, and I am not sure what will happen in the future. Our central discussion focused on millennials. Are other North Korean generations also involved in that new creative network? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, generally speaking, millennials are defined as uh, people who were born between 1981 and 1996, more or less. But I mean, I think in case of North Korea, it's a performative identity, in my view, meaning um, I would like to define millennial generation not strictly by age, but by uh, way of their worldview, their tax savviness, and their willingness to participate in this kind of surreptitious social network of sharing and spreading forbidden media, and especially their uh, ability and willingness to also be a part of marketplace economy. So I think those are all kind of qualities and characteristics of millennial generation in North Korea. So sometimes you would find more senior kind of uh, participants, such as people in their 50s and 60s, actively smuggling these foreign media, selling them on marketplaces and profiting from them and thriving under these unusual circumstances. So in my mind, they belong to millennial generation as well. So I would say that it's not strictly age definition when we speak of North Korean millennials, although vast majority of people that I'm considering tend to be more or less younger people uh, born between 80s and late 90s. But there are exceptions to the rule where you have much older generation that we wouldn't necessarily consider millennials, such as Generation X, displaying all the qualities of what I would call millennials. Younger generation of kids, uh, Generation Z, I think are more familiar with cell phones. And I think I heard a lot of stories of them playing video games on their parents' cell phone. But Um, I haven't really researched them yet because there are significantly fewer of them and um, the the kind of more ethnographic groups that I have access to tend to be millennials for the most part. So what have I learned so far? I mean, being engaged in this project for several years by now is that North Korea as a society and North Koreans as people are not that different from everybody else in the world. I mean, you know, I myself belong to Generation X. And when I go into classroom and teach my students who tend to be Generation Z, I've also taught millennials a decade ago. And I always like sometimes roll my eyes and say, my God, with this like tech gadgets, cell phones, they have lost contact with real human beings and they don't know how to communicate with each other. My God, where has humanity, you know, what has humanity come to? And I roll my eyes and I think I hear same kind of sentiment in, in North Korea as well. Um, I've interviewed a couple of people who belong to my own age group, Generation X, and they say, oh my God, back in back in the days during my time, People used to read, they used to be educated, they knew how to solve math problem. But this younger generation of people, all they do is like stare at their cell phones. They don't know how to spell simple things. And what has this generation, you know, become like, where is humanity going? So uh, what's really kind of uh, fascinating for me is that although we tend to bracket North Korea as a very different place in the world that is stagnant, anachronistic, and has been sort of an island. That's not the case, especially when you look at the seismic changes that have taken place in the past 20 years, and the generational gap, and the definition and characteristics of this tax-savvy generation tend to be very much shared across the board. To conclude, do you believe that North Korea has reached a point of no return, so to speak, on foreign media and uh, the impact it has on its society? Yes, I think uh, North Korea has reached a point of no return as far as it concerns the uh, circulation and popularity of South Korean media. I think the government will up their game in terms of controlling the flow and surveillance. But then people will kind of respond to that by becoming more creative, (laughs) circumventing um, the surveillance mechanism. I mean, that has been the story of past 20 years. And I think it will continue on. Professor suk Kim, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me.
This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episodes, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or with any podcast app, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. For more information and our archive with all previously released episodes, please visit our website.